radiation doses from fluoroscopic procedures, including interventional radiology and interventional cardiology, make up about 20% of the medical dose to the U.S. population. While there's been much recent attention to radiation dose from CT and an emphasis to reducing CT dose, the radiation dose contributed from fluoroscopic procedures should not be overlooked. A unique difference between CT and fluoroscopic procedures is the range of doses. This table shows some typical effective doses from fluoroscopic procedures, and you'll see that even for the same type of procedure, there is a broad range of doses. Because of this variance, even small modifications to optimize techniques can dramatically decrease patient dose. The goal of this training is to equip fluoroscopic users with methods to optimize patient radiation dose and reduce occupational exposures. This training also fulfills the Joint Commission requirement for annual training of all individuals who use fluoroscopic equipment. Campaigns such as Image Gently, Image Gently Step Lightly, and Image Wisely provide some useful resources to aid in reducing patient and staff radiation exposure. In addition, the IAEA has developed poster training tools that address radiation protection for children, patients, and staff in fluoroscopy. Materials from these organizations will be used in this training. The training will be divided into two sections. The first is dose optimization for patients, and the second is radiation protection to staff. Prior to starting a procedure, it is recommended that planning be done to avoid improper or aborted runs and other unnecessary exposures. A safety checklist can be used to increase awareness among team members. Some useful resources in this area can be found on the Image Gently and Image Wisely websites. Now I will move through these next few areas quickly as they should be reviewed for most fluoroscopic users. Depending on the type of procedure, the ideal setup may not always be possible. However, keeping these optimization techniques in mind and using them whenever possible will aid in reducing patient and staff doses. When positioning the patient and the x-ray tube, maximize the distance between the tube and the patient. Doubling the distance from the patient to the tube decreases skin exposure by up to a factor of four. Similar to increasing the distance from the tube to the patient, minimize the distance between the patient and the image receptor. When possible, avoid exposure of the same area of skin in different projections. Vary the beam entrance by rotating the tube around the patient. Keep in mind that oblique projections have higher skin doses than AP or PA projections. An increased number of oblique projections leads to higher skin doses and increases the probability of skin injury. Moving into the next section, I will talk about optimizing equipment settings and acquisition techniques. One of the most practical ways one can optimize patient radiation dose and reduce staff exposure is by knowing how to optimize your equipment. This includes being familiar with all imaging modes and exposure rates associated with those modes. Examples are floral flavor or gain settings such as low, normal, and high. Within the fluoro modes, you may be able to select the frame rate for fluoro, cine, and digital acquisitions. In most cases, a lower frame rate leads to lower radiation exposure rates. Use the lowest frame rate possible for that given procedure. Use pediatric protocols when children are imaged. This should include lower frame rates and increased filtration. For children under 20 kilograms, it is recommended that the grid be removed and an air gap technique be used instead. When acquiring images, minimize the number of digital acquisitions and CINE runs to a clinically acceptable level. CINE and digital acquisitions can have exposures 10 to 100 times greater than fluoroscopy exposures, so whenever possible, use the fluoroscopic last image hold instead of CINE or digital acquisitions. Some examples comparing fluoroscopic exposure to digital acquisitions are in this table. You can see that for the same field size and frame rate, digital acquisition exposures are much higher than fluoroscopic exposures. When possible, avoid using magnification settings. Decreasing the field of view by a factor of two can increase the dose rate by a factor of four. Collimate the x-ray beam to the area of interest to avoid exposing tissue not relevant to the procedure. When possible, shielding should be used to protect the patient's thyroid, breast, eyes, and gonads. This is especially important when doing procedures on children. Just be sure all shielding is kept out of the primary beam. When performing fluoroscopic procedures on children, extra care should be taken to optimize dose and protect from unnecessary radiation. Prior to the procedure, discuss what will be taking place with the child's parents and ask if there has been previous exposures. Use this time to answer any concerns they may have about radiation safety. It is recommended that you use resources available on the Image Gently website. 
Once a procedure is complete, the cumulative dose, air kerma, or the dose area product must be recorded in a retrievable format, such as on packs. If these dose metrics are not available, record the total fluoro time. This is part of the new Joint Commission requirements. It is recommended that notification levels be established to inform fluoro operators during a procedure when a designated level is exceeded. At that point, the operator should determine whether the radiation risks are warranted and if the procedure is to continue. Some recommended notification levels are in the table below. These include peak skin dose, air kerma at the reference point, reported in gray or milligray, and the air kerma or dose area product. Once the first notification occurs, we recommend continuing to notify the operator at the subsequent notification levels noted in the table. Depending on your manufacturer, the reported units may differ. Similar to having recommended notification levels during a procedure, the Joint Commission requires facilities to have radiation exposure and skin dose thresholds. If these levels are exceeded, then a further review and or a patient evaluation is to be performed to check for adverse radiation effects. The facility is also to review and analyze these instances where the dose thresholds are exceeded. It is recommended that the threshold for review and analyzing the event be set at a reported air kerma of 5 gray or a fluoro time of 60 minutes. The facility should follow up with the patient to assess for skin damage if the 5 gray limit is exceeded. The facility should also then review and analyze that case to determine if improvements can be made. Also note that the Joint Commission considers it a reviewable sentinel event if there is a peak skin dose of 15 gray. Now I won't spend too much time on this table, but it is good to have an idea of when skin injuries from radiation can occur. The threshold at which radiation-induced skin injuries can be observed is a skin dose of 2 gray. Below 2 gray, there are no observable deterministic effects. Above 2 gray, there is the possibility of skin burn, hair loss, and worse. As mentioned earlier, a follow-up evaluation with the patient should be done for any procedures with a reported air kerma value greater than 5 gray. Now you may question why the recommended follow-up threshold is 5 gray, but skin damage can be seen starting at 2 gray. Why not have the follow-up threshold be 2 gray? The reason for this is the reported dose, or air kerma, is at the reference point of the system and does not necessarily correspond to skin dose. A reported air kerma of 5 gray at the reference point is roughly close to a peak skin dose of 2 gray. Moving into the next section of radiation protection to staff during fluoroscopy, I'd like to review annual radiation dose limits. As occupational radiation workers, we have annual dose limits of 5,000 millirem for the whole body, 50,000 millirem to the skin, and 15,000 millirem to the lens of the eye. Note there is a lower dose limit if you are an occupational radiation worker with a declared pregnancy. Also note that the dose limit for the lens of the eyes will likely be changing in the future as evidence that the threshold for cataracts is lower than originally thought. Along with annual dose limits, we are required by law to keep our exposures as low as reasonably achievable. This includes training, oversight, audits, surveys, and reviews of exposure. Compliance with ALARA means we are required to use protective devices such as lead aprons and leaded eye protection. It is recommended that skirt type lead be used so it better distributes weight. Note that using just 0.25 millimeter lead provides more than 90% protection from scattered radiation. In addition to personal lead, use ceiling suspended screens, lateral shields, and table curtains. They too provide more than 90% protection from scattered radiation. When available, it is recommended that a mobile floor shield be used during cine runs or digital acquisitions. When working on the patient, keep hands outside the primary beam unless totally unavoidable. Hands inside the central area of the beam will increase techniques and doses to the patient and staff. Make every effort to position yourselves on the detector side of the gantry. Only 1-5% to of radiation entering a patient's body exits the other side. This means most of the radiation ends up in some sort of scatter. Standing on the detector side, where there is only 1-5% to of the incident radiation, greatly reduces exposure. This is outlined on the scatter plots on this slide. As you can see, there are much higher exposure rates on the tube side of the patient than on the detector side. Therefore, it is recommended that the tube always be kept below the patient instead of above. Undertable systems provide better protection from scattered radiation than do overtable systems. The last topic I want to cover is the use of personal dosimetry. In general, all personnel in a room during fluoroscopic procedures are required to wear personal dosimetry. For those that perform a lot of fluoroscopy and stand near the patient or radiation beam, it is recommended that two dosimeters be worn. 
one inside the apron at chest level and the second outside the apron at neck level. An additional ring dosimeter may be issued for procedures that require hands near the primary beam. If only issued one dosimeter, wear this badge at neck level outside the lead apron. Remember, in order for dosimetry to be effective, it must be properly worn and then turned in in a timely manner. To summarize, radiation doses to patients and staff can be greatly reduced if practical optimization steps are taken. These include planning the procedure in advance, positioning equipment and the patient to reduce exposure, and using optimized settings on the equipment. For fluoroscopy users, wear personal lead and use mobile and fixed shielding. Whenever possible, stand the detector side of the patient. Wear your dosimeters and turn them into your radiation safety officer or manager when due. Remember, reducing patient radiation exposure always results in lower exposure to staff. Now I understand a fair amount of material was covered in a short amount of time. This was intentional as time and attention is limited. Handouts and a list of references is available for download. It is recommended that you review these references for additional guidance.